The peace of the Lord be with you. And good evening and welcome to everybody uh, as we gather uh, for the Monday Thursday this evening. Uh, a couple of announcements, uh, just a reminder, we also have Good Friday tomorrow at 7. I'm sure you all know that, but just a reminder. And then on, on Sunday, uh, the service is at 10 a.m. instead of the usual 9 a.m., but we'll have the Easter breakfast at 8.30. And, um, and then a correction, I sent out in the email this morning that, uh, that I'll be aiding with the, the uh, Easter Vigil at Redeemer in Elmhurst. The address for that is not 821 Spring, it's 821 St. Charles. So my apologies for the incorrect, I'll update it when I send this, uh, this tomorrow, I'll update the address in there as well. But uh, I wanted to make sure you all, you all knew that in case you'd like to join us. It begins at 7 p.m. So uh, please feel, to, feel free to join us for that. Um, other than that, our opening hymn this evening is hymn 617, O Lord, We Praise Thee, hymn 617, and we will sing that after the pealing of the bells.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. During this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that prevents us from trusting in God and loving each other. Since it is our intention to to receive the Lord's Supper, uh, excuse me, to receive the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ on this night when he instituted this blessed meal for our salvation, it is proper that we complete our Lenten discipline by diligently examining ourselves as St. Paul urges us to do. This holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort of those who are troubled because of their sin and who humbly confess their sins, fear God's wrath, and hunger and thirst for righteousness. But when we examine our hearts and consciences, we find nothing in us but sin and death from which we are incapable of delivering ourselves. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us. For our benefit, he became man so that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God and to deliver us, took upon himself our sin and the punishment we deserve. So that we may more confidently believe this and be strengthened in the faith and in holy living, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. It is as if he said, I became man, and all that I do and suffer is for your good. As a pledge of this, I give you my body to eat. In the same way also he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Again, it is as if he said, I have had mercy on you by taking into myself all your iniquities. I give myself into death, shedding my blood to obtain grace and forgiveness of sins, and to comfort and establish the New Testament, which gives forgiveness and is everlasting salvation. As a pledge of this, I give you my blood to drink. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, confidently believing this word and promise of Christ, dwells in Christ and Christ in him and has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, showing his death, that he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Giving him our most heartfelt thanks, we take up our cross and follow him, and according to the commandment, love one another as he has loved us. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are all partakers of this one bread and drink from this one cup. For just as the one cup is filled with the wine of many grapes, and one bread made from countless grains, so also we, being many, are one body in Christ. Because of him we love one another, not only in word, but in deed and in truth. May the Almighty and merciful God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit, accomplish this, uh, accomplish this in us. Amen. Amen. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our sins, imploring God, our Father, for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Amen. Amen. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. God, be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in peace. Amen. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. 
I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, in this wondrous sacrament, you have left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that we may so receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood, that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifest in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Maundy Thursday is from the 24th chapter of the book of Exodus. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the just decrees. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars, according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from St. Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, the tenth chapter. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our Lord's words in the Holy Gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said, said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for our hymn of the day, hymn 766, Our Father who from heaven above, and we'll sing stanzas 1, 7, and 9. Hymn 766, stanzas 1, 7, and 9.
the sixth petition. And lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. In the name of Jesus, Amen. God tempts no one. When you're experiencing temptation, which you do, in fact, you do by virtue of your baptism and your faith, which put a big target on your back, but when you experience that temptation, understand that it's not God's doing. It's your own. James says as much in the first chapter of his letter. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed away by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has fully grown, brings forth death. You see, God tempts no one. It is your own sinful desire that harbors that thought, that harbors that that draw to the thing which you shouldn't do. It's your own sinful desire that nurtures that, that gives birth to it, that brings about your death. And that's what makes temptation so difficult, isn't it? It's so hard because of that pull inside of you that drags you into that desire. It makes you give in to it over and over again. And over. And if that wasn't enough, then look at the point that Luther makes in the reading from the Catechism that we just had. God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that he would guard and keep us so that the, 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 excuse me, the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us, or excuse me, mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame or vice. Because although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we would finally overcome them and win the victory. So that's why it's that much harder, isn't it? It's not just your internal sinful nature. It's the pull of the world around you as well. It's the pull of the the comforts and pleasures which are immediate and not delayed. It's the people around you who are also sinful but whose approval you desire as well. And of course, God's approval should be the most important thing, right? But just like those, that gratification, the approval of people is immediate too. It's visible. It's concrete. Whereas with our Heavenly Father, we have to wait till the last day to hear his word of approval. So yes, the world and our sinful nature make it hard. In fact, they make it hard enough on their own. But then in addition to that, you have the devil on top of it. And now it's that much harder. And look at how Luther then describes these temptations. I always think this is so insightful how he does it, right? We pray that God would guard and keep us, that these forces against us would not deceive us, would not mislead us into false belief, into despair, into other great shame and vice. You can hear the depth there, right? In fact, as we've been talking about the the petitions of the Lord's Prayer this Lent, you can maybe even hear that connection that I keep coming back to, right? If you you recall, I, I keep talking about how there's this component in these petitions that's doctrine and the component that's life, the component that's faith and the component that's love. We see a glimpse of it here too, don't we? You see, we seek, to be, we seek to be protected from deception. Which, of course, we could be deceived into false living. But that's probably something derived from false belief, isn't it? It's derived from the idea that if I do this sin, the enjoyment that I get from that will be greater than the enjoyment if I don't do that sin. That's a false belief, isn't it? And then keep going. 
you have not only deception, but you have the actual mentioning of false beliefs. That harkens back to, to the first petition, right? Hallowed be thy name. God, let your name be holy, doesn't it? And do you remember what we said with that? What, what makes God's name holy? We said that God's name is holy when what happens? When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity. And why does that connect here? Because you see, the truth and the purity of God's teaching provides the most pure and proper faith in God. You know, it might seem that false teaching isn't a big deal. You know, it might seem, for example, that the, the differences between us and other church bodies aren't, aren't a big deal. And, but this tells us it does make a difference. Now, as I say that, to be clear, I'm not saying only Lutherans are going to be in heaven, right? But the point is that any false teaching puts one more obstacle in the way of a true and pure faith. So there's this doctrine part, this faith part that's important. And then Luther keeps it going because he connects it actually to despair itself. Now, as I was reading about this this week, the, one of the authors I read made a great point that, that false belief and despair actually go hand in hand. Not, not, they don't go hand in hand in that they're the same thing, but they go hand in hand in that they're complements to each other. And what was especially related by the author was, was the, idea that, that, uh, uh, the idea of false belief in your own righteousness and goodness. The idea that your own righteousness and goodness would be sufficient before God in heaven. You know, it's easy for us to look at ourselves and then to look around at the world and to think we're pretty good people. And that's getting easier and easier to think the more that we look at the world around us then the more it appears that the world's going crazy, right? The more the delusion for us will be believable, the crazier the world gets. But yet the idea that we would be good enough of ourselves to earn our way to heaven is a false belief. But of course then, when the, the devil convinces us that we're not that bad, he also convinces us that if we commit that sin that we're always tempted toward, and you know the one I'm thinking of, well, you don't know the exact one I'm thinking of, but you know in your own mind what that temptation is, because you experience it. But he likes to make you think that that sin's not that bad either, right? But then what happens when he convinces you of that and you give in? Guilt, right? Then he comes to you and he makes sure you see just what you've done, right? And it's that point that despair comes in so easily. And why does the devil want you to despair? Or maybe we should ask, what is it exactly that the devil wants you to despair of? Christ's salvation for you, right? He wants you to think that somehow your sin is bad enough that Christ's sacrifice on the cross can't cover it. Or maybe he wants you to think more so that your sin is so bad that yes, Christ could cover it, but it shows the insufficiency of your faith. In other words, it shows you, he shows you your sin, so you, you think that you don't actually have enough faith to be considered a Christian. And so you, in that, you despair that you'll be with the Lord on the last day. You see, all this is that doctrine component, right? The faith component, isn't it? But then there's the life component, too. There's that other great shame and vice. You see, the devil wants to draw you into those actions as well, those idolatrous pleasures that you give into, those ways where you focus on the world and worship it instead of God. He wants to draw you into those subtle ways where you harm your neighbor as well, those ways where you harm the neighbor that's maybe an authority over you or harm those that you should care for bodily or those you lust, at, lust after, or those whose incomes you should be guarding and keeping and improving, or those whose reputations you gossip about, 
or maybe it's just your covetous desires. It doesn't matter, because it's all there. And when we realize this, we see the temptation all around us, don't we? And it's challenging, isn't it? It's in that draw to the sinful action, it's in that life, it's in the false belief that is in doctrine. And as we gather on this Monday Thursday then, it's good for us to reflect on temptation altogether. And in fact, it's good for us to reflect on that temptation in view of our Lord's passion. Because you see, it's with that in mind that I think we can make the connection to the Lord and His prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, as I said, that, that might seem a little bit odd, because here we are on, on Monday Thursday, and, and, and first of all, it might seem odd, because usually on Monday Thursday, what do I talk about? I usually spend most of it talking about the Lord's Supper, right? Because that's the night that it was instituted. It might also seem odd, because usually when we have the reading for Gethsemane, that's on Good Friday, which we will have tomorrow night in our Tenebrae service. And it might also seem a little bit odd, because... It doesn't actually say that Jesus was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. But I think we can say that he was. I think we can draw that from what happens. I think we can also draw from from what happens at the cross in the same way. Because you can imagine in both circumstances, when the Lord is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and when he's on the cross, that there was the urge to run. In fact, that's why they bring up the Garden in particular. Look at his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And in that, to be sure, we do hear the Lord's faithfulness, not as I will, but you will. But you can hear the pull of temptation, can you? Let this cup pass from me. It's as though he's saying, Father, if there's any other way to save these people, let's do it that way. And why? Why? Because he knows what's coming. Right? He knows how horrendous it's going to be. He knows just how much our wretched sin deserves. And so even he is feeling the pull of temptation in that. But just like we heard in the first week of Lent, so we hear again, where we are unfaithful in temptation, Christ is faithful. We see that by the garden. The spirits of the disciples are are willing, but their flesh is weakened and they can't endure, and so Christ does it for them. He prays for them. And He goes on from there. He goes to the cross from there. And again, surely at the cross He was tempted as well. Tempted by the calls to save Himself. Of course, not just for His own good, but that He could prove that He was the Christ in coming down, right? And I always say that we can imagine our own response. If If we were hanging on that cross... What would you do? Wouldn't you be drawn to jump down? Isn't that what, what, when somebody tells you you can't do something, they don't believe you can do something, isn't it your in, gut instinct to, to prove to them that you can? To show them just how able you are? But not the Lord. No, for us men and for our salvation, He remained hanging on the cross to death. And on Sunday, we'll celebrate the joy we have in that because He did it for us. He did it for you. He did it because you do fall short in temptation. He did it because, of course, as you have things in the Bible that you read, you don't understand them. Whether that's actually because of your own sinful neglect and not reading it, or because of your weakened ability to understand it. But Christ had the perfect understanding for you. He remained on that cross because you're still drawn to think that you are good enough to earn heaven. But he really had to do it for you. He remained on the cross because, of course, your faith is insufficient. And even his faith had to save you. And he did it so now he can save you. He did it not only that he can save you, but that he can strengthen you and help you in temptation daily. I'm sure you've often heard that God will not give you more than you can handle. That's actually not true. The law of God shows us, because it tells us, do this and you will live, 
But you can't do it. That's why Christ had to do it for you. That's why death comes. But I think the reason why people say this, that God won't give you more than you can handle, is because of 1 Corinthians 10.13. It says in 1 Corinthians 10.13, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Right? It says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Again, you see, He doesn't tempt you. Instead, when you're tempted, He provides the way of escape. And He Himself strengthens you for that escape. That's what His death and resurrection are. That's what your baptism is. That's what the Holy Supper that we do celebrate this evening does. It strengthens you for that good escape. And as we speak of the Lord's Prayer this Lent, we also see that prayer strengthens you too. Because you see, prayer is the turning of your mind from that thing that's tempting you, that sinful draw that you have, to the object you actually should desire, to the one you should desire, to the Lord. Luther said this differently, and I really appreciate this image. He said, if you, if you try to help yourself in temptation, it's kind of like, you know, if you try to do it on your own, you try to do it without prayer. If you try to do it by your own thoughts and counsel, you will only make the matter worse and give the devil more space. For he has a serpent's head. If it finds an opening into which it can slip, the whole body will follow without stopping. But prayer can v- prevent him and draw him back, or drive him back. And I love that imagery, right? You can picture the snake slithering through a hole, right? Once the head's through, the whole body comes. And that's the way the devil works with temptation. He will try to slip in through that tiny crack and tempt you. But prayer can drive him back. With all this in mind, then, I have just one more thought to conclude with. I began with this point that God tempts no one. And this is true. However, something that can be confusing is that the word in Greek for temptation and testing is actually the same word. And we can see, in fact, that God does test people. He talks about this when he brings them out of, out of Egypt into the wilderness. He says, yeah, I brought you out to test you. Luther said it in such a way that he, in fact, understood God permitting serpent, certain temptations that they would be allowed by him to test us. And he said, in fact, that we should not only pray, lead us not into temptation, but let not these things become temptations to me. Let no thing become a temptation to me. Because he understood that even good things can be abused, right? But as we reflect on this testing, I think it can be hard. Why is that? Because it can feel like God is putting in this spot and setting us up to fail. Right? And then we ask, why, why would he do that? Why would he test us and let us fail? But this last weekend, one of the kids had a, a, a test in a martial arts class. And it was sort of fun because they had like 30 kids there testing all at once, and you see all these kids doing these forms and that kind of thing. And, and, and you look at that, though, and, and, and then you wonder, how can they actually have any kind of real evaluation of these kids when they're all 30 doing the same thing at the same time? And a part of it was that they had us parents aid in that evaluation, but let's be serious, parents aren't exactly objective observers, right? But you see, in addition to that, the teacher made the point. He said the point of the testing wasn't really just about the kids doing this kick or that punch, but it was encouraging them. Because you see, what had happened is that by the time these kids were asked to come to the test, the teachers already knew that they were succeeding and they wanted to encourage them in that success. When you're tested by the Lord, you can understand it a bit that way. Now, of course, it's more serious, and you don't want to just go through life assuming you're going to pass all the time, and so don't study, so to speak. But know that in the tests, you're not passing because you're good enough. You're passing because Christ has taken the temptation for you, and He has succeeded. And you're passing because a part of that testing is that even when you fail, ultimately your hope still rests on Christ. It rests on Him and His forgiveness. That's why you pray. God tempts no one. 
but your prayer calls on Him and brings from Him that victory in Christ. And it's in Him that you finally do overcome the devil, the world, your sinful nature. And it's in Him that you have the victory. Yes, yes, it shall be so. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Please rise as we confess that faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 8 of the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us, help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death. Good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of our death, and in the day of judgment, help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you, to hear us, good Lord. To rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living. To put an end to all schisms and causes of offense. To bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived. To beat down Satan under our feet. To send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand, to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. To give to all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend Joseph and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all the people, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage and to have mercy on us all, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. To forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their heads, to tur- excuse me, to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. We continue with the offertory hymn found on page 10 of the bulletin.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross, that where death arose, their life also might rise again, and that the serpent who overcame by the tree of the garden might likewise be, by the tree of the cross be overcome. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do as often as you eat it. This, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Now this is the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Strengthen and preserve you in body and soul. In the one true saving faith to life everlasting, to part in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father. You have given us a foretaste of the feast to come and the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn for this evening is How Beautiful, and you can find that printed on the, the back page of the bulletin. Uh, with the, the melody is printed for only for verse 4, but the, the verses 1, 2, and 3, we'll sing all four verses, I should say. So we'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, all, all printed on that page.
beautiful the hands that serve and the bread of sun, the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walk the long dust roads in the hill of the cross. How beautiful. How beautiful. Oh. 